This video is sponsored by Dendron. Welcome back everyone. If you're new here, my name is Brian Jenks and today we're talking about Dendron. So I've played with Dendron before and Dendron is an extension within VS Code. So it's a bundle of functionality built on top of the platform that the VS Code IDE or Integrated Development Environment already presents and gives away for free because VS Code is open source. Now there is VS Code, which is owned by Microsoft and VS Codium, which is the same thing, but without all the telemetry, watching your data kind of stuff. But Dendron, the amazing Dendron, is an extension that you just add on to VS Code that extends its functionality and lets you do a lot of new and cool things. And so we're gonna look at Dendron in detail today and where it can accentuate your workflow expand what you can do, and the unique approaches it takes to a lot of different things in the note-taking space, and how it actually is really well geared for developers or people taking notes on structured information that still needs to have some level of flexibility and fluidity in its connections. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned. So I have actually used and played with Dendron before. Now, early on, it was interesting to me, but it was just a little off-putting. And this was a while ago, and it's been in, de in development for a decent amount of time, and they've actually received funding and are really picking up steam with a you know, larger team, more, more people contributing to the project, and it's really gotten very far from that initial point. But that's not to say the initial point was the... You know, it just wasn't a really great app or extension. It's just that for the at the time, it just wasn't working for me. But some new ways I've been looking at information and how I want to treat information has actually opened up the door to Dendron for me. And it's actually the place where my developer blog or devlog lives. So when I take notes on anything related to technical information or things that are relevant to my job, which is in IT, uh, this is the place where I store that information. I have the fluidity of being able to do bi-directional bracketed links to, you know, related information, but with the dot hierarchy and relational schemas that you get in Dendron, it's actually incredible for building structured notes on things that are very similar in structure that you want to take notes on, such as programming languages. You know that there are going to be loops in just about every programming language, so having templates and, and an existing structure for that type of note taking is awesome and it saves time and it just makes it easy to fit information into those existing hierarchies. So there's a level of rigidity in structure, but still an allowance of free form fluidity and bi-directional linking. So we're gonna cover all of this stuff in gross detail today. So this is gonna be a long video, buckle up. And there's gonna be a lot of timestamps, so if you're interested in something specific, feel free to jump around, but we're gonna dive into this today. The best ways to support the channel are, if you're going to do it on an ongoing basis, GitHub sponsors because they take no fees, followed by Patreon. If you're gonna do like a one-time thing, buy me a coffee, PayPal, or just fine. And if you just wanna support me without any money involved, the best thing you can do is like, comment, subscribe, share the video, and that's it. So we're gonna take a brief look at Dendron and where this might actually fit into your workflow if you already have an existing workflow with tools like maybe Notion or Obsidian, LogSec, Roam, etc. So looking at you know my example, my uh, Dendron vault in VS Code, which is really just my developer blog or devlog, and I have a bunch of different stuff here. Where I think Dendron really fits in and has carved a niche for itself and something I haven't seen in anything else to this day is its unique approach to hierarchical organization while still allowing a freeform structure with bidirectional links and still top level management. Now, what do I mean by all of those things? So when I say that it has its dot hierarchies what that looks like is I can see this tree view, which is a piece of Dendron functionality. It's not just like the list of files that you normally get with VS Code. It's a dropdown, um, you know, bunches of nested dropdowns of different topics. 
and you know you can go into here and I can click on this and I can say containers Kubernetes and I can look at you know whatever I, I have on this. Now where this is different than just other files is that if I actually open up the actual file view, you know, close the tree view, this is actually what the files look like. And at first this may look like a incredible mess. Like you just have like these long, long file names, but this is the key point of value in Dendron is that there are no folders with this. I mean, there are a couple folders, but it's not for your files, your notes. So I have, um, I forget exactly what IAC means. Uh, oh, that's right. So if I have, um, there's also abbreviations. So I have a bunch of these abbreviated. So S dot is software. And so if I find my note, that's just named S, which uh, is somewhere around here. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but actually we can just open it S. So you can see right here, it'll show me a preview and I actually have this set. So this way it's easier to type things, but S is my, my schema, my hierarchy for just things related to software. And so, and we were looking at uh, the things above here, which was s.iac and a bunch of notes. Those are infrastructure as code. So if I did s.iac, then this shows me, ah, infrastructure as code. So I can keep my typing short. I can get suggestions. It shows me the completion. But the way that this is just in incredibly powerful is one, that tree view in Dendron that shows me the breakdown. So I can organize things easily just by the name of the file, but it also allows me to easily search for things too. So if I know that something is related to software, I know it's in the dot, the, the S hierarchy. So I can say, well, I don't know where I filed something on Docker. So I could say S dot, and I could say, mm, I don't know, wildcard search with an asterisk dot Docker. Mm, that's not showing anything. What if I just did uh, star Docker? Mm, still nothing. So maybe S Docker. Ah, there we go. So with this, you're actually able to determine where something might actually be. Now, this was actually supposed to work, and so I'm not sure why it was uh, being a little bit hesitant, but yeah. So S dot asterisk. And so really where the hierarchy comes in is that it organizes your stuff in the tree view, but when you actually look up your notes, if you don't know exactly where something was filed, you can do these regex search patterns, or at least wildcard searches, where I just say, I don't know the middle of where this is. I just know that the top parent is like software and Docker's in there somewhere. And so this will actually surface everything on Docker for me. And so I could say um, asterisk again after Docker. So Docker dot and asterisk tips. And it might need a little bit of help moving along to this, or maybe not tips, yeah. but where you get this incredible search feature is really helpful, and I don't know why it's sometimes it's lagging a little bit on the structure, but it's really awesome when you can search through your notes like this. Now, I keep things sorted pretty rigidly so I don't have to deal with a lot of you know finding and surfacing things, and sometimes it's just easy when you just want to do Docker because then I can say, oh, here's where everything Docker is. And there, oh, there's other stuff in here too. Oh, those are my inputs. So searching in here is incredibly awesome because it can find inside of these schemas wherever that, that word is or phrase is. And you can also search by the hierarchy. And let's say I wanted to move Docker completely elsewhere. You can refactor the entire hierarchy and move it somewhere else because it's all rigidly structured. Let's say I want all my Docker notes and I don't want to put it under a software um, parent. I can make something new and put that under like just uh, IAC. And let's actually run through an example of that. So if I actually open up a note on Docker, for instance, and I want to move all things Docker. So I could say refactor hierarchy and all this stuff is going to be covered in detail as we go. But like this is just an example of where this is just really incredible and useful for well-structured information refactor hierarchy. Okay. So I'm going to say, this is the before, this is what it currently is. And so I copy what it is at currently say, this is the before. Now the after I want to remove the, the S hierarchy and just leave it as IAC. So a whole area just for infrastructure as code. Now, if I do that, enter, it's going to ask me, Hey, you, you sure? And it's going to show me the preview. Hey, all of these befores are going to look like these afters. And you can easily look at 
Okay, these are all the things that are going to be modified and changed, and then you can confirm or deny that you want that change. And then it renames all of those notes. Wow, let's do it. I mean, it's it's not a big deal. I can just refactor all of these notes. It says this is deleted because it's just been renamed. But then, if we actually go to the uh, files, and we'll let it finish thinking really quick, because it's going to rename all those. Oh, wow, they all disappeared. What happened? So let's collapse the tree view. And first, let's look for IAC, which is where everything is organized. And now I don't use this view because Dendron does not work well with just this file view. But um, let's try and find it. There you go, IAC. And now it shows green because I actually have Git version control on this because again, VS Code, very friendly for developer tooling. But now all these new files exist here, IAC dot whatever. It's really just a bulk file rename. But when we open up the tree view, I can look at collapse that IAC and under IAC containers and it would, I need to refresh the index first actually. So reload, sometimes you have to do this, reload the index and it's going to find all of those notes for Docker and Docker containers. Do, 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 do. And uh, it will move all of those, actually there, some of them are down here, it looks like, but it will move all of these files over to IAC and underneath that, um, it'll have its own subject area. There we go. Containers, Docker, Azure development, all this stuff is now under the IAC tab, its own parent level, highest level. And that's how easy it is to move a hierarchy around. You want to rename a hundred files at once, easy to do it when you can just refactor these hierarchies that way. And it's really just a before and after snapshot. So if you want something to follow a consistent pattern, you don't just change the first thing in the beginning, you can change anything you want about it. And where this really comes in handy is when you want to take a lot of structured information and move it around, change large swaths of information according to a structured approach, or you just want to have a level of rigidity on the structure that you have. So if you want to have all programming languages follow a consistent structure, they have notes on loops, on variables, on classes, that's easily possible with templates and schema files. and. It's really, really cool. If you want that level of rigidity on like technical content or factual organized content, this is going to be a great tool in your knowledge worker toolbox. So this definitely has a place in your workflow because of its unique approach on organizing information. All right, so how do we get started with Dendron? Now remember, Dendron's just built on VS Code. So first of all, you're going to have to install VS Code. But once you do that, what's the next step? So I have an empty folder on my desktop just called Dendron Example, okay? Now in VS Code, I can then open a folder. Now I've already done that, but you can open your folder in VS Code, which is, here we go, Dendron Example. Now from here, I have the Dendron extension installed and it will load my million extensions, but here we go, Dendron. Now Dendron will install Dendron Paste Image um, as well. And there's a couple other things that it conflicts with, but for a safe environment, the best thing you can do is just try deactivating everything and just have just Dendron, just uh, the paste image and see what you can do from there and expand. I also use to do tree, but we'll get into that later. All right, so you have an empty folder. There's nothing here. You have Dendron installed. It's all open in VS Code. What's next? So the first thing we're gonna do is we need to initialize our workspace. And Dendron doesn't know what we're doing right now because it's not paying attention. It doesn't know it's supposed to be doing anything. So Dendron, and we're gonna look for initialize workspace. And okay, a dedicated ID for your workspace, native workspace, mm, alongside my existing project. We're just gonna say code workspace, a dedicated workspace for our notes. And I'm going to find my folder and say create workspace there. It's going to reload the window because it actually treats this as its own dependent work workspace. Its own thing is going on here. Okay. So it's going to load, it's going to start working, and now we're actually going to have to go and open up that workspace. So right now we're working in VS Code. And so um, Markdown shortcuts is recommended. I don't want that at the moment. Okay. So it's starting, and you can't see it because of. I'm in the way, but it Dendron is starting. You can see it in the bottom right. And it's going to find that workspace. And we may need to actually open up the actual folder that it's living in, because if I can see this vault thing here, 
this might mean we're a level too high in the actual dendron space. And I think we might be, or maybe not. Okay. Maybe not. Okay, so tree view. We got the root vault. And this is basically your home page, the the index, the, the first place that you're gonna start off at. And everything spins off and comes off of the root because it's the root. Now, everything we're gonna make is going to be dependent on this, but you don't really treat this as the parent object for everything. It's just, it actually is the parent object for everything. But when you're in Dendron for the first time, what you can actually do is take a guided tour of Dendron. like. Where do I go next? What am I gonna do? Now, they actually have a guided tour. So it's, uh, you know, here's some other links for the Dendron stuff, but we can actually do, and I believe it might be a tutorial, launch tutorial. So again, I'm launching these commands with uh, command shift P to launch the command palette. Um, and I believe on Windows, it's just control shift P and that, or you could just do control P and hot tip is do the you know bra angle bracket and then we can do that. So tutorial and launch the tutorial. And from this, it will actually walk you through a guided tour of Dendron within VS Code. So we could get started and you could follow this. It's gonna open up a workspace. It's gonna be like its own demo tutorial workspace and get the basics on the functionality. And so once you're familiar with this functionality, you could play around with this and come back to the video and see like how I'm using these things because it's going to take a while to load up here. So we'll just cut back to when I can start walking through features again. All right. So now that you've got everything installed, you've gone through the tutorial, you're getting, an, you're understanding a bit of the functionality of Dendron. Let's actually review what the extension provides, the panes, what you can do with them and a little bit more in-depth information about the actual extension. So diving in, we have, of course, a lot of the normal VS Code uh, panes. We can do you know, different views of a, a particular item or document. And because this is Markdown and I have um, Dendron either installs it automatically, yeah, show preview. So they do install it as a bundled piece of the extension where you can actually view your notes in a previewed pane because these are all Markdown documents. But because Dendron uses its own particular viewer, you can actually do uh, bracketed links and it actually displays um, pieces of information specific to that bracketed link. Like you can do uh, previews or you can embed notes or you can have footnotes and other different things. So we're just gonna do software or something like that. Now, if I open up that note, it doesn't exist yet. So I actually need to um, cl click to create it. And so if I do that, it will let me create this note Sometimes I have to click it. Sometimes I have to say, go to note. Um, normally I don't link before creating, but here we go. So we have a note name software. It's got nothing in it, but we could say, hello, YouTube. Okay, save that. Now we don't even have to really save our documents because Dendron will automatically auto save. So if I just put um, another few lines, Hello, and it's you can see it's been edited, but it's not saved. If I go to the other note, it usually will auto save. Yeah, see, I didn't click save; it just auto saved automatically. So now, when I link to software, it actually exists. So you can see it's not like a yellow link anymore, um, and that could just be you know my color theme it could be a different color for you. Now, sometimes I could have sworn it does a, a little hover preview. Maybe that's only okay. It's only when it's actually in the edit mode. So if I just hover over it, it will show me a preview of what the actual contents are in the note. If I hold command and hover, it will actually show me a little bit of the metadata as well, which is that ID. So each of these notes has you know pieces of metadata in this YAML header. Now there's a setting also that you can do to collapse this and keep it hidden if you don't care about it, but we can actually see this here, hover, command hover or control hover to see the information. But where this actual preview comes in handy with Dendron is I can do the exclamation point, just like in Obsidian, Rome, any of these other things, and it actually will embed the actual note itself. And it shows that it has a child note when it's changed to embed. So I can say, go to text, and it's actually going to take me to this particular note while still showing me the root view, even though I'm on software. But then when I click on the software and actually do that, there we go. 
it'll actually change the view. So a lot of these different pieces of linking are the same across the different applications. Now, if I have a heading in here, a little bit of lag on this thing too. Okay, so I have a heading and I also have a sub heading. And we're gonna add some content over here. And let's add a little bit over here. Now, because these are different heading levels, um, let's actually indent these a little bit more. So we need to add a couple more there, and then we'll add a final two level, because what you're gonna see is pretty much the same as Obsidian, is it levels of scope. So if I save this and I go over and I want to actually link to a particular heading, I can go into the link itself, do a you know, hash mark, and it will actually let me link to a particular heading in that document. So if I do hello, and you can see it, it took a while to think about it, but when you do that hash mark, it'll let you actually see a menu of the links or the, the headings you're trying to link to. So it, right now it's looking at just a level two link. So hello, hello final. And so if I did hello, it's going to show me only the contents in that first heading, which would be right here, which could also be this a, a deeper level. So we have to wait for this to actually refresh sometimes, which some, maybe it's just my system because I'm also recording at the time. But let's actually try forcing this to reload. So refresh, and then once it comes up, eventually, it should show only the content from that second level heading. Now, why it's not doing that, I am not absolutely sure. Hello. Or maybe it's just everything below and it's not levels of scope. Okay. So heading. Okay. So the way that we're going to do headings in Dendron is not levels of scope like it is in Obsidian. So this actually is a difference that I just learned. So in Obsidian, it will show you everything either at um, the exact level, so the heading, the second level two heading, and anything below it that is either under that level two heading or is a sub-level. So level three heading and everything, four, five, six, anything underneath those. Dendron does not do that. What Dendron does is it just says this heading and any and everything below it. So it's a little bit less specific than Obsidian, and maybe this is just a different take on it, but you can, and that's originally the point, you can link to a specific heading and show just the content below that. So it is very useful. But let's say we also don't, we don't want this link in here to, uh, let's actually remove the preview. So let's say I want to link exactly to that heading. I can you know, hold command, click that link, and it actually takes me directly to that heading because it's a link. So now when I go to the uh, back to the root here, and I want to display this. I don't want it to display as just software or, yeah, because that's the name of the note it's coming from. It doesn't say it's going to that heading, but let's say I want to say something specific. So we could say heading in software and add a pipe. Of course, it mangles my text, but the pipe and doing an alias of the note and showing what you want it to display the text as is just the same as it is in Obsidian, except for the uh, desired text is on the left instead of the right. In Obsidian, the aliases are um, text on the left and then the alias on the right. So this is just switched. But a lot of the same functionality exists. I don't think block level references exist in here yet, uh, if they do at all. Yeah, I don't think they exist at all, even though it does come from a VS Code extension called Foam. Maybe they'll add that, maybe not. But you do have the ability to link to notes, headings, and re-alias those links to say something different in different text. So moving on, we have the preview, we have the edit view, and the tree view is one of the most important parts of Dendron, which is when you make a note and add a new dot hierarchy to it. So I have software in here. Now it doesn't, I don't see software in here anywhere. Where is it? So we might have to reload the index to say, hey, there's new stuff here, buddy. Ah, there it is. And so that's exactly what happens. Sometimes you do have to refresh the index. It's not constantly you know, running stuff in the background and taking up your RAM. 
So here we go, now we have software. Where the tree view really comes in handy is when you want to add child elements to this note. So we could say, hey, what about software? Well, I could do, and here's where Dendron's own command palette comes in. Command L, Control L, depending on your system. And there's a lot of buttons and features in here. We'll get there. But here's the note, my current note, software. What I can do is I can expand its dot hierarchy. Add a dot, what am I doing? Well, there's no other notes, so it doesn't know to show you anything, but we're gonna make something new. So software, languages, okay, doesn't exist. Create it, create new, yes, create new. So it will create a new note. And now you can see in the tree view here, it's created a child item. The preview has updated because I actually am on a new note now, but we're not stopping at languages. I'm going to say Python. Okay. Python language. Okay. Well, it, <laughs> it totally mangled that on me. So I'm going to rename it. Um, let's just do rename. Dendron rename note and rename it as Python because come on computer, keep up with me. So now we have several levels of dot hierarchy in here. So now I can also add, instead of Python, I can say Rust, create new. And now in the tree view, you can see that now the children of the languages, the actual languages, are at the same level. And this is where it gets really, really exciting, is that you can organize your information like this, just like folders, but without folders. Because if the folder was just languages, languages is its own note. You can actually add content to this note specifically for languages in the context of languages, but you can have it be whatever you want. It's not just a folder, it's a note in of itself. And that's when you can start seeing a little bit of the power of the dot hierarchies, organizational, organization wise, but also just the structure it adds. And you can actually add context of what you're about to see at the child levels in this parent level item. So tree view, a lot of great stuff in there. But just like in Obsidian's uh, most popular plugin is that you do have a calendar view. Now there are daily notes inside of Dendron and everything in here can be configured. And it's also an open source project. So if you ever wanted to configure anything or go even above and beyond, totally able to do that because Dendron is open source. You can do whatever you want. So in the daily note, you can just say, okay, we're on the 13th, click that. And it's going to create your daily note for you. So here's the default schema of everything, daily.journal.year.month.day, a lot of dots. But where that again is really, really awesome and handy is that now in the tree view, after we reload the index, because it's got a, oh, hey, new stuff, think about it, daily journal. So is it your journal? Is it a, you know, a, a blog or log or vlog or whatever you're gonna do? Like basically you can make multiple things than just a journal. And then you could also have you know, the different items here, or you could say, hey, daily journal, all the different schema stuff, and then 13th, but then 13th what? You could have 13th.devlog.personaljournal.work journal, whatever you want. However you wanna structure this information, it's possible and really awesome. And what this also really opens up for you is because it's nested in this level is that I have 02 for February and then 13th of February today. If I had 03, 04, 05, and it's organized like this, then this becomes my annual review note, my monthly review note, and then the daily actual notes. So that alone is an incredibly awesome way of organizing and structuring your daily notes because you can see those review periods of you know a year, month, and then day. And even if you didn't want, if you wanted to do weeks, I've I've even figured out ways of doing weeks. I just don't really care to do that level of granularity for my reviews on my technical information. But this is awesome. And this is actually something I really, really love about Dendron's dot hierarchies when it comes to the daily note structure. The dot hierarchies work well with organized information. Daily notes follow a chronological period and are organized by those, those periods, year, month, day. So it really lends itself to this organizational method. Awesome. So beyond calendar and tree, we also have backlinks. So if I actually go to the root, we can see that the root will actually have a backlink to the software note. And again, I might need to actually uh, update, or actually no, it's gonna be reverse. Software, ah, it's gonna have the backlink to root because we're linking from the root note into software. So going backwards, it's going to root. And so you can see here in backlinks, I'm on the software note, it's saying, hey, 
root has a backlink and then it actually shows you, okay, linked, note updated, blah, 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 the actual line of text it was on, click it, it goes there. But also in the actual preview, it shows the backlink is root and the children are languages because again, this is part of the dot hierarchy software languages is its child. It doesn't show all the children, Python, Rust, anything else you have. It just shows its direct child languages. Click languages and it was going to update itself in the preview eventually to children, Python and Rust. Wow. So this is where you get your backlinks from. Now you don't need any of these others. These are just default stuff from VS Code. The open editors are just, just these panes and the actual um, file explorer itself which because of the way that Dendron uses information and its dot hierarchies, every file's at the surface level, this just looks like a mess. Not really the greatest thing to interact with. But then what are these YAML files? Root schema? What is that? What on earth is this? So this is probably one of the more confusing parts, but also where a lot of the really incredible automation functionality and developer oriented workflows come in, into play, which is the actual schema files and the setting and settings and configurations that are modified through YAML files. And we're gonna get into all of this. All right, the Dendron command palette. Now in VS Code, the command palette is normally command shift P, control shift P, etc., which looks like this. It's one of the standard menus. You can do the angle bracket after just typing control P, control P just looks at files, angle bracket, now you're in the command palette, at sign, you're looking at symbols, etc. But Dendron has its own command palette, which is control L. And so what this is going to let you do is if you're on a current note, so I'm on this note, but let's actually go to a markdown note, control L, or command L. And now it opens up the name of the note. It shows me the schema this, or the, the dot hierarchy, the schema, software languages. And it shows me the actual note itself, the children, because if I had a description, I could actually have to say software languages, save that. Now, if I close the menu, command L, and now it shows that description right here. That's really handy when you wanna have a little bit more information or you have it just like very short letters like I do when you wanna know what it is, but you wanna save on typing. So now it'll show me the children, which I can easily then just start to search through. So I just wanna say, okay, dot P for, okay, it only now it's filtered to just Python. I always have the option to create new, but now it actually shows me Python. That's really helpful for filtering and searching but there's a lot of other options in here that you can hover over and find too. It's really just the Dendron commands, but in a GUI form. So I could select multiple notes if I wanted to and do something with them. I could um, copy a link to that particular note. I could uh, filter to just the direct children. So if I was in my actual main, um, my main notes going over there, and I wanna go to, let's find Docker. Do, 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 make it think less, docker, okay, docker. Now what I want it to do is let's say, let's filter to just direct children. So there's a bunch of dot, additional dot stuff, but let's filter to just the direct child filter. Hmm, okay, so dot, and then there we go. So now it's only gonna show me directly the children instead of anything, because if I turn that off, now it shows me everything which can be useful if you're gonna do a bulk search. So let's say modify is the thing we're gonna do. We could say modify, doesn't find it, can't find it. But when we turn that off, now it can show me, okay, I think I know what you're looking for in there because I found the word modify. So it can be helpful to narrow the scope, but sometimes you might want that larger scope. Next, we also have um, selection extract, which is gonna extract the highlighted text, copy to a new note, which can be done with something like, and this is this is another really cool piece of functionality, if we return back to the main example, is if I'm on a note, and let's just say um, coding is, come on, cool, and I wanna select this text, and I wanna make a new note from this text, but attached as a child to the current one. This is something that you can also do, sort of, with Obsidian and its note refactor plugin. So really awesome piece of functionality. But let's say I select this text, I do Command L, and now I could say, okay, let's make a new note and languages, and let's just do um, important dash fact. Okay, and then it doesn't exist, obviously. Create it, yes, create. 
Now it has extracted that text. It is no longer text on that note. It is now in its new note here. So that note refactor uh, functionality, the pull text that I have selected and put it into a new child note from the current one is built in by default. And that's and really, really useful because I use this all the time when I'm making coding notes. Let's just say you flesh out a note. It's really comprehensive, really long. Well, it's easy then to just say, select this new child, new child, new child, and just pull that text into smaller notes to make them a little bit more atomic and you know narrower in scope. Really, really handy. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff, selection to link, um, selection to items. If you wanna like make a, I don't know, selection to list, create a journal note. This is when you can click on the calendar or you can do this or you can just run the commands themselves. So you could just basically do most of what you need to in Dendron straight from this uh, command palette, or you could just do the VS Code commands, either one. Create a scratch note. This is kind of a little bit of a hidden thing. It's kind of on here, or you can do the, the command itself, but scratch notes are kind of like those one-off ideas, or if people who are really into Zettle costing, it's kind of like your, um, what is it, the seed box, or just like all the beginnings of ideas. We could create a scratch note and just go scratch dot and then a timestamp, including I think this is seconds in the ISO 8601 standard, but it's going to give you a scratch note, scratch idea, and now you have a scratch note from that exact day. So you can collect all of your little one-off ideas and come back to them later, delete them when you're done, whatever you want to do with them. So that's also built in by default. You can also create um, task notes, and we're gonna get really into tasks later on because I got a lot of new information about that I wanted to show. But we could also create a note and then open it to the side and you know, create a task note. There we go. We're gonna say, what is the, the task for the scratch note? Test task. Don't leave spaces, use dashes. And there you go, now there's a task. Okay, well, we're gonna get into tasks later on. But one thing I really like is uh, opening a note in um, the additional side menu. So you can always just drag this over to there, or you can always just say, hey, I'm gonna make a new uh, window. And though this is when you might wanna learn some hotkeys in VS Code, but I can do Command 2, and now that actually opens up that second area. And I can do Python, find Python, and open it up in that second area. So multiple ways to get something done. I thought you could just open it up from the command palette, Maybe there's a setting I'm missing, maybe not, but that is the amazing command palette for Dendron specifically. And it's not Command P or Command Shift P, it's Command L or Control L. And that will open up your current note, show you the children, or you can then delete that and then search for anything. And you can see all these different areas. So I could you know, tab through them, tab, 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 and find what I'm looking for. Now I can move my arrow keys here, tab on scratch, find the item I'm looking for and select it like that and then tab there, find out, find out, and then add something new if I want. So it's really, really, really easy to move around your content, move around your notes, create new notes, and traverse these dot hierarchies. Really awesome. And if you're looking for more information on the actual languages used in the files that Dendron is using and built on, which is mainly just Markdown and YAML files, I have a video on my channel, which is a comprehensive look at a lot of uh, the Markdown specifications all in one. And so there's a great resource there of a lot of the stuff that's already in, built into Dendron, stuff like LaTeX math, diagrams, um, the bi-directional linking stuff. There is some differences between it and Obsidian and a lot of the other applications that use a lot of the extended Markdown formats, but a lot of it is in there. So I already have a markdown kind of course already set up and it's all in one so you can check that out yaml i don't really have anything specific um, i have some videos that reference yaml but yaml is such a very minimal syntax it's like json without braces uh, you can check out more on yaml on youtube there's like a couple of videos that are like five ten minutes long and really everything you really need to know about it is in there and yeah so check those out if you want to know a little bit more about those languages it might come in handy all right Next, let's look a little bit more into some of the features that you can do inside of the documents themselves, Markdown. Now, I already mentioned I have a Markdown course, but I also have a Mermaid course. Mermaid is a diagramming language in um, you can do inside of Markdown documents. And I've done content on Mermaid either in our Markdown documents, normal Markdown documents, in Obsidian, in Dendron, 
um, and I think even in LogSec, but Mermaid is pretty ubiquitous and there's a lot you can do with it. But just to show some examples of some features that you have available to you in these Markdown documents within Dendron and VS Code, you got tables, you can insert images, you have LaTeX math, you have the actual mermaid diagrams, you have code blocks, so I can show different code syntax highlighting. I can do bi-directional links, you already saw some of these, and link to the actual file. The great thing about Dendron's previewer is that even though you have these long schema names, it only is gonna show the actual name of the file that you care about, which is in this case, Python. And you can even embed these items. Really, really awesome. And to show you like why uh, Dendron, the extension comes bundled with the uh, image or paste image plugin, is that if I take a picture like this and I want to actually paste the image, um, I think my command there, paste image, um, there we go. And it will actually paste the image like this. Now, what it does with that image is that there is a you know meta hidden folder in Dendron that the default settings create. So if I went to assets in here, it's actually gonna show me that assets has a folder called images and images contains both of these images. And so you can actually tell Dendron where to file these images just like in Obsidian, but by default, it just works right off the bat. And so you can put any of these things inside of your Markdown documents. So like I've mentioned, Command L, Control L is your friend. It's gonna allow you to access a lot of the functionality of Dendron and it's going to let us do a lot of things with the dot hierarchy schemas. And this is where the real power is. So what happens when I actually make a new hierarchy or a new schema in a way? Schemas kind of, it's more of the, the YAML files that actually determine the structure of the notes. But when you actually make a new hierarchy, what actually happens? So when you actually make a new hierarchy, you can see that I have root, uh, root here. Now it's not root dot whatever, it's then I have a software schema or a software hierarchy. And that's where all software related notes are then built from. So when I make a new note, a new hierarchy, let's close all these things. So when I make a new note, so I can say, what do I want my hierarchy to be? I can say knowledge, okay? So I'm gonna make a new hierarchy, create new. Now there's no dots, there's no nothing, it's just the word knowledge. This means I'm making a brand new hierarchy, okay? It now exists. So you can see it here in just the plain files menu as well. But now it exists. I can make you know, child notes. So I can say um, management. I can also go up a level. And one thing you can do with hotkeys in traversing these levels is do command shift up arrow. That takes you up a level. I can say then do command L again. And I can make a new child, knowledge management knowledge uh, distillation, okay? We got those those new notes and those are now part of the knowledge hierarchy. If I can go down here to the tree menu, you can see that those now are there. If I open up the plain old files view, you can see that they are there. Now, Dendron also does have a graph. It's not quite as rich and feature filled and have as many options as the Obsidian graph. But again, it also is built off of these hierarchies and schemas. So when I have a node for knowledge, I can see all the branches coming out of knowledge and it looks a lot more like dendrites in your brain, which is where dendron gets its name from. So I can actually open up my graph by doing um, shift command G and I can show the full graph. <coughs> and for this sample vault, this is what you see. You see um, not a lot of variety in the structure of this, but as you can see, the start of it is always root. So even if you have these notes with the hierarchies that stem off of them, knowledge management, knowledge distillation, they always return to the root, the central point. Everything stems from the root. And so this is how the graph works in Dendron, is even if it's a local graph, it'll just be this type of graph, but for your local notes. And this shows you how everything stems and structures from the root. Now, if I show you my vault uh, for my personal or my technical notes, um, it's actually moved over here, and I show you that graph, it's gonna be a little bit more um, feature filled because this is the local graph because I actually had a note open. But if I show the full graph, it'll take a minute to load because I have like 3000 notes or something in here, but you're gonna see how much this can show you. Now it's really hard to see in here. And this is again, one of my 
One of the things that I hope changes is that the CSS styling of the Dendron graph, um, I'm not sure if that's been fixed yet, but it kind of broke during between a version change or something. But you can see how all of this stuff stems and constantly forks outwards. It's not quite as dense and uh, fluid as Obsidian's graph, but it still serves its purpose. It shows that rigid hierarchy and organization of everything. And hey, here's something that doesn't actually have a connection. So there's the, the root over there, and it shows some of the hierarchies there. And But hey, I thought the root was the center part of everything. See? This is actually something that also comes up, is that this is another vault of mine. I have two vaults in here. So my main vault uh, inside of this uh, graph here is all of this busy stuff going on. This is actually my main, um, my main vault, and there's the root right there. And so this is how Dendron's graph works. And so I don't really use the graph a lot to traverse in here. Um, I, do pretty much just prefer to do the looking up and um, wildcard searches and using the organization of the hierarchies to traverse around, but it's still really cool to see how different perspectives on the organization and presentation of this knowledge actually looks like. So this is ultimately what the graph is fed by, these hierarchies. So let's say you have your notes and you have links to all these notes, but what if you wanna change the names? We've, we've looked at briefly how to move a hierarchy or change a hierarchy. You can, you know, basically it's renaming all of those notes to something different. And you can do hundreds, thousands at a time. And what if you want to name a specific note and you want to rename it? And how does it, how do the links get updated for any of these notes when you change them? What can go wrong? So previously what's happened is if you renamed a note and you didn't use Dendron's command to do it, it would actually break the link. So if I renamed this note, it would actually not update here where it's actually linked and that would cause broken links. But now, even if I rename the, the note with something else like the file utils extension instead of Dendron's extension, if I rename this to like S, you can see it actually updates correctly in the links. So now this is just like Obsidian. You, you don't even have to think about updating all the links throughout your entire vault. You just change the names of the files and they update accordingly. If I change this heading, add an S to it, you know, save that note. Does it work over here? It does not. It actually will break the link, it looks like, if it still links to a heading. But if I, you know, try and type the heading out again and try and get a uh, menu, eh, it doesn't look like it works. Still looks like it's uh, trying to give me code snippets. If I do it there, I'll have to do, redo that, but see, that is actually, uh, sadly, a broken thing, is that it won't link to headings still. Maybe that might be a bug report that, have to, that has to get filed, but at least updating the links to the notes themselves robustly takes care of itself. You don't even have to think about it. You change the names, you update the hierarchies, everything cascades, and all of the links remain and are not broken. So like the prior examples, when, what happens when you get too many notes? There's so much going on. What, how do you organize all this? Do you do Zettel constant? You, use, you can't use folders. And how, how do we approach organizing and standardizing a lot of this structured information? And that's where I think Dendron definitely has its own place in the sphere of PKM, personal knowledge management, is that it is perfect for structured information that you still want to have dynamic bi-directional links to other things like notes that you have on those you know, technical content, structural, factual notes and information, but still having a rigid structure like folders, but without folders. And this is where it definitely, definitely ha like just holds its own against so many other applications because I haven't seen anybody do anything quite like Dendron has. Now, what happens when you get too many notes? How do you organize this? How do you approach this? Well, Dendron is taking a very interesting and unique approach to organizing and standardizing a lot of this content. And because we are in VS Code, an IDE, an integrated development environment, a place where programmers and software developers go, have all the tooling available for them to do what? To manipulate text. In the end, code, software, it's all just text. That's really all it is. So if we have all these tools that make it easy to utilize and manipulate text, well, this is the perfect place for a personal knowledge management environment. 
So Dendron takes a very unique approach. If you have a structured content like a software language and you want to have always have a note for loops and variables and object-oriented programming for every language that you create. If I make a new note, Python, a new note, Rust, a new note, JavaScript, and I create that, I want to know that, oh yeah, I could probably make a note on loops and object-oriented programming for each of those languages. And what if I have templates for those things? All of this stuff is where schemas come in handy. Schemas are YAML files that live alongside your Markdown documents in Dendron and tell your documents and through the Dendron command palette, what exact template to apply or what child notes are in the standard template. Because you're not just limited to what is in the template or the schema, you can make your own. But the schemas help give you hints and let you know where things are or when they're created. And you can also try and just create a schema right off the bat. So we can say schema from the Dendron commands. We can say look up the schema or create schema from a note hierarchy. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do create a, um, a new schema from a hierarchy, but mm, it won't let us do that because it doesn't have a gr depth greater than one. That's because S is the top level schema or the top level in the hierarchy. Sure, it's a child of root, but we need something else, languages. So we're gonna go to software.languages. Uh-oh, this is a problem. Software is not the top level domain. It's now S, it should be S. Now from the prior uh, clip that you saw, I renamed S and it did update the links, but it doesn't update all of these children notes. This is when you need to refactor the hierarchy. So this is where, let's say, we need to uh, refactor the hierarchy and we need to say anything software dot, because remember, this is just a wildcard. This is the before. So I don't need languages there, but software dot is gonna get changed to S dot. Enter, it's gonna say, hey, is this, this is the before and after, is this right? That is correct, proceed. Rename these files, and it's going to update those files correctly. All right, and so then we're gonna have languages. And is this gonna be correct now? It is, s.languages, great. So now that we have everything in the same hierarchy as it should be, we're going to now create a schema file from this note because this is a child note. It has a depth greater than one. So we're going to say, create a schema from note hierarchy, okay? And the hierarchy level that this will be for, and it's gonna be S dot, yep, whatever. And honestly, I find it easier to just do this straight in YAML instead of doing any of these menu things, but we're gonna do this. So we'll match notes like S dot languages or S dot Python, S dot Rust. So we're just gonna keep it as a wild card, bam, just like that. Okay, okay, and yep, enter to confirm, there we go. So then it creates this, this is the default. Version one, you don't really need to care about that. Imports, we don't need to care about that at the moment because that's getting into more complexity, but here's the schema. The schema is ID, the ID is S, the title is S, which is basically pointing to the software note or do, 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 command shift up arrow, that is not what I wanted. I want to take this note to software. So we are going to refer to this. And so this is note is S, its title is S, okay? And I'm going to open the schema on the other side. The title is S, the root is S, and the parent is root, okay? So this basically says, this is the ID of the note, this is the title of the note, okay? title. So basically, if you set something and it doesn't exist yet, if you set a note and it doesn't exist and you create it and it has a title here, it's going to rename this note with that new title. Okay. So let's actually test that, right? So what happens if I actually delete this note? What happens to these notes? Nothing. Those notes are still exist, but the schema will be like, hey, there, there's something here that shouldn't, that, that's not here. It should be here. Okay. So let's actually delete this note. Okay. We're going to delete file s, okay, dendron, or no, we're just going to file delete, okay, now you can see that in the tree view for dendron, it says, hey, where did s go, there's a plus sign, the plus sign actually tells you when something is, is a part of a, an established schema, and it's missing, or basically when something is just missing, so if I click on that plus sign, it's going to then create that note, 
Actually, it should have deleted. I might need to refresh the index because that should be gone. Delete, then reload index. Okay, so it does not have languages, but oh, hey, or S, there's this little booklet. So this plus sign means that there is currently no note there. It doesn't exist. It's a space holder. So all these other notes actually have an S in the front of it. And you can see that in here. So S languages, S schema, YAML, but an S.MD document, not there. That's why the plus sign is there. It's saying, hey, this doesn't exist. But what's this little booklet thing? The booklet right here actually lets you know that this note is a part of a schema file. It's part of the structure. So having this means, oh, hey, that's actually supposed to be here because that is part of this document or this uh, schema. So when working with schemas, the title doesn't update the title field in the note itself, it appears. It's part of how it, it actually shows and displays inside of the uh, Dendron command palette. So this entire schema, all it really says is for the note titled S, so this note S, its parent is root, so we know exactly where it's coming from. So it places it in the global hierarchy, root S, okay. Now, any children of S, what are those children? They have to match a pattern. The pattern, a wild card. So basically, any child of the note S is considered part of this schema. So that actually shows it as, now if I actually reload the hierarchy, reload index here, so we can see that S is part of the hierarchy because in the schema because it has a little booklet here on the um, far left. I'll try and zoom in a little bit here. Now also on the far left, languages is part of the schema because it has that little booklet. Now, what happens if I make that, or what if I want these languages to be a part of the schema itself and I want them to be well-defined? Well, I could hard code them manually. I could make a list of acceptable values um, and just make a, a basically a template. So what we can do is let's just add a bunch of stuff here. So children. So basically after the S node, the S file, any of its children, so that would be languages, so basically any next level uh, node, any child, that node, or in this case languages, really you could just say languages. You don't need a wild card here because you're only putting it in one area, but you could say languages and it has a children of pattern, Rust, pattern, Python, because these are actually lists in YAML. So Rust and Python are now part of the schema saying languages can have the options Rust and Python. Now, what happens when I have like these other pieces of metadata, title and description for this child? This child doesn't exist yet. You don't see it in here now, I've deleted it. So I'm gonna create a new one, but where does this stuff come in? Does it update the new note? It does not, I thought that it did, but it doesn't. So when I actually say s dot, I need to reload the higher index again. Okay, so when I say s dot languages, yes, tab. Now, where's where's Rust? I don't see you see Rust in here anywhere. Okay, that's weird. Dot. Ah, okay. So now that we're looking at the sub area, so when I go backwards, the dot is saying, hey, well, actually, let's back up. When I say just languages, it's only looking for things that exist because I'm not telling it to look at another level. I'm basically saying all notes that are s dot languages, and then what? What is the children of that? But when I do a dot, it's saying, hey, next level of the hierarchy, show me all the child areas under languages. So this includes things that exist and do not exist because Rust doesn't exist yet. That's why it has the plus sign. You don't see it over here. And look what it tells you, s dot rusty. Okay, well, that was the title and then description was testing. So this can actually inform you on whether you actually want to create this note in this schema, or if the note exists, what its details are. So I'm gonna create that note, okay? Language is Rust. It does not say Rusty where the title is. It does not update the description, but when I go to the um, Dendron uh, command palette, hmm, okay, it still says Rusty here for the title but it doesn't update the description. So the description is only when you're working with the schema at the beginning. Then when you update the description in the actual note, post creation, save it, command palette. Now 
you can see it actually updates the description. So in that way, the descriptions in the schema file only show you details when you're trying to create new notes that are in part of the schema, but do not yet exist in your vault of notes currently. So this is a really powerful feature. And if you're already lost and wondering what the hell was all of that, what is going on? It's really, 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 really simple when you just look at the bare bone bullet points, okay? Version, doesn't matter. Imports, don't think about it right now, too complex. Schemas, we're only working with one thing. ID and title. You can even forget title. ID, S, is referring to the note S. Title is just what's going to display in the command palette. Software. If I could spell right. Okay. Now if I go and delete this note, there we go. Okay, I'm going to delete S. Okay, now I'm going to open up something else. I'm gonna say S. S is a part of the schema because ID. Now, title software just shows this here because it, now it doesn't exist right now. I just deleted it. It doesn't exist. We're creating it from the schema. Schema says S is the title or S is the ID but then title is software. That's why it's showing software here. That's the only place that's gonna appear. I create that, bueno. Okay, software. The parent of this note is root. That's why parent is root. And for this first node in a schema at the highest level, like this one, the parent is always going to be root, but it doesn't always have to be root if it's in uh, schemas for deeper levels of um, notes, okay? So ID, title, parent. Now. This note, s.md, has children. Okay, but what are the children? How do I define what children it is? It is a pattern. Okay, the pattern is wildcard. So basically, s.anything is the child. Now, that only goes for the first dot, because if you have s.language, dot, nope, that's the next level. It only looks at the next level. So, does language fall into here? It does. Let's make it a little bit less confusing. Languages. So now it's explicitly saying that one file, not just anything, okay? So the child of S matches this pattern. The pattern is languages. S, child is languages. It matches the pattern. Now this note, languages, can have children. Well, how do we define its children? They match pattern. What is the pattern? Rust, Python. Where's the booklet? When in doubt, refresh or reload the index. There it is, okay? Now, just like in this one, title displays in the actual uh, command palette. Description, same thing. When you're creating schema stuff, okay? And I have to show you, uh, delete the Rust file again. Rust, delete, reload. Actually, I don't have to reload the index, okay? So then s dot languages, okay, dot rust. And that is where rusty and testing, rusty and testing. So those two fields appear in the command palette. If you're following so far, you're off to a great start because that is a bulk of the schema information that you need to know to be successful with schemas. And if you want to see some more ex uh, advanced examples of schemas, Let's take the one, look at the ones in my personal vault. All right, examples of schemas in my personal vault. I have several that I'm just going to show off here. Now, for I made all of these from scratch. I typed them out from scratch. I find it's easier just to do that. So my log is really just my daily note, my daily journal. And, you know, it has the, note, the parent note log, which has a parent root. Its children match a pattern, and the pattern is daily, okay? The children of daily, so we could see in here, log daily, okay? This is where you can actually use regular expressions. Now, if you use regular expressions, wrap it in quotes. And so you can see here that I have um, a regular expression that basically looks for um, a number up to two and then three numbers up to nine. So basically for my entire lifetime, I'm not gonna go into the year 3000, so. But this basically matches the years 2021, 2022, et cetera, et cetera. And then that note has children, same numbers for the months, zero to one and zero to nine. 
and then for the days. And this basically makes every single uh, note match based on year, month, day. And that is my log. Now, there's also some other information here. And you can actually use um, templates on these notes by adding an additional key value pair, which is template, and then the ID, which is the actual full file name of the template you wanna use. And I just put mine under templates.log.annually, and the type is a note, okay? And that, what that lets you do is that actually generates your new notes in the missing, um, when you're trying to create something that's in your hierarchy, but isn't doesn't exist yet, it would actually create that with the template content. And we'll take a look at an example of that later. So you can actually do uh, templates this way in the schemas. Now you can insert templates just by inserting them, just like in Obsidian, you can insert a template into a new note, willy-nilly, any content you want. But if you wanna have new notes create themselves with content, based on specific templates, and you don't wanna to have to manually insert them, it's just, hey, these 50 things in this schema, in this hierarchy, should always have um, template content inserted when it's created. You can have all of that stuff defined programmatically in these YAML files. It's incredibly useful. Next, we have um, the task template. And this we're gonna get in a little bit more into later, but again, you know, you can have children that match patterns that have children that match a pattern that have children that match a pattern that use a template that also have other patterns and children templates, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on and on. Basically just think of it as nested levels of defining who is the child that matches a pattern. And if you want to see something, my craziest uh, schema, it's my software schema, basically IDS software root. And then I have all these children that match patterns. Some of them have titles when I'm inserting them. And this basically defines all of the structure that I have for coding languages when I take notes on coding languages. It is incredibly useful and very helpful because when I make a new language, I get all of this helpful stuff because I can go and say, let me open up the root and then say s dot, I need to reload the index. When in doubt, reload the index. Okay, s dot software, come on, software. Man, it is not cooperating with me today. Oh, because I'm in the wrong vault. I need to go to the root of my other vault. Okay, so root in devlog. Then s dot l because l is for language, and you can see it's in the description. L for language dot, and I have all of these languages that are available to me, so I can just leave it as s dot l, and it shows me a bunch of languages that are available. Okay, so what do I want to choose? Let's do uh, actually, what's a language that doesn't exist yet that I have? Let's do Go. Okay, doesn't exist. Create new? Yes. Okay, create new. So I've just created a new language note for Go. Okay, if I do L again, because Go now exists, but I don't have any child notes for Go, but I have a schema that defines my software language notes. If I add a dot, it gives me all of these suggestions of things that I could make notes on. And this is the power of it, is that I could actually add descriptions to this, I could add titles to this, like it says data types, even though the note name is only data t, data structures, data s, and it tells me all these suggestions that I could actually make for notes on a coding language. And this is one of the most powerful things that I love to use in Dendron that help me take notes on code. Okay, you hear me talking about YAML a lot. YAML this, YAML that, schemas, what, what, front matter, ha. Huh? YAML is a very simple and really useful language. It's a superset of JSON, which is a data interchange format, JavaScript object notation. Now, YAML in these markdown documents, for the most part, probably shouldn't be touched, but what you can do and can modify, really in this case, is title, description, um, because these are going to change displays of information. Now, you don't have to use and update these things. It is nice, it adds polish, it adds, uh, helps things look a little bit better. But you can also add your own custom stuff 
if you want to. This is getting a little bit more advanced, but you can add custom key, uh, key value pairs and custom front matter to your notes in YAML and extend the functionality of Dendron with JavaScript hooks and other stuff. But that's where you start getting into more of like developers would be doing that kind of thing. If you just want to use this for notes, then you don't have to pay attention to that, but you can actually add your own custom front matter. And when we take a look at the task feature later, you'll see a lot of the custom front matter is, there, there's a bunch of new stuff that comes up when you deal with task notes. But at least when you're dealing with you know, notes like this, you can actually change the titles and the descriptions, which really just changes how things appear in the command palette of your notes uh, when you are actually selecting them. So if I change the title of this note, software, and then um, I can change the description, all things coding, save that. Let's always, when in doubt, reload the index, and then we're going to open the note. And so that's where the display changes, software, software, all things coding. And this is where those fields would then actually update some stuff. And pretty much always name your files using no spaces, always just use dashes in between the words but you can update the front matter and change the display of these notes anyways. Um, yeah, and have fun. <laughs> so a lot of these applications, Dendron, Roam, LogSec, Obsidian, they all have templates and snippets. And wow, where do we begin with that in Dendron? So the way I like to think about templates in Dendron, if you've been coming from uh, Obsidian, for instance, where a lot of my content is on, I like to think of the templates in Dendron like the daily note template in Obsidian. When you make a daily note, it uses that template, but you're not inserting the daily note template manually, whereas you might in manually insert templated content like a heading or a, a code block or something. So inside of Dendron, what I like to use is, um, so we could say, well, for this note, Rust. Now it doesn't exist right now, I deleted it. So the template is gonna be the ID, so I believe I need to do the ID equals, um, we're going to do templates.rust, and I think that might be it, or type, yeah, I'm the type. And so the type of that type is going to be note. Okay, so I need to make that note first. Template should either be a string ID or, yeah make it a string. Uh, it is not happy. I'm not sure why it is not happy. Okay, so now it's happy. Now we have it looking for a template. So let's actually make that new note. So we're gonna make uh, workspace root, we're gonna make templates dot, actually let's make dendron new note. Man, this is not working with me today. So I'm going to make templates dot rust. And inside of here, I'm gonna say, this is a rusty note. Okay, so this is going to be what the template looks like. This would be like your daily note template in Obsidian. Every daily note gets this inserted. Okay, so we're going to close this because we don't need it. Now, Rust is the note that is a child of languages that is a child of S. So S, okay, we're going to expand on that dot, and then I need to reload the index, of course, as always. So S dot languages yes dot rust all the details appear here testing rusty testing rusty okay now when i click on this and i actually create the rust note i have a piece of metadata here in the schema it says template the idea of the template is that note that note now exists the type i'm going to insert is note so do that and then rust will now say this is a rusty note and you can see that when you can define the schemas for your daily notes annual, monthly, daily, and you can have it point to templates, you can insert content on a standard basis like this. I never need to actually manually insert code via a template like we do in Obsidian for daily notes. Daily notes happens always, but what if you had a template, a standard template 
for every single one of your pieces of standard structured content in Dendron via your schema file. This is a lot more granular control than we can have on Obsidian's daily templates, unless or Obsidian's templates, then we have to get like much more in the weeds. This is just a standard way of fairly easily defining what notes receive what standard content. But let's go a little bit more deeper into this. What if I want to do manually inserted content and I wanted to actually insert something that I define and I want to actually be able to insert it manually whenever I want? This is when code snippets come into play. Now, Dendron code snippets, if I do command P, not L, because L only looks at markdown documents, but when I do command P and I can look for the Dendron files, so dendron.code snippets, that's what I want. And we can see we actually have some examples here. This is the exact format of code snippet files in VS Code, period. So for Dendron, this is the one that Dendron looks at. So inside of our Dendron vault, we can actually define notes and use them. So let's actually create a custom code snippet, okay? So what is the description of the, of the snippet? I'm just gonna say YouTube, hello. Okay, the prefix, what do we want to actually have trigger this? We could do RU for Rust, and the scope is just gonna be Markdown, because I don't need to have it be anything else. Okay, I'm going to do three backticks, a new, uh, the word Rust, a new line, and I'm gonna do a, another new line, because I want to um, go from Rust, I wanna go to the new line, go to the new line, because I wanna leave an empty space, Okay, and that will now insert an empty code block. So let's say Rust code block, and then save it. So now we have our new code snippets, and I'm in my Rust note, and I wanna manually insert some content. So I could do RU, and hey, here we go. YouTube hello, RU is the trigger, and we could see it over here, Rust code block, and you can see it has Rust over here. Insert that, now we have a Rust code block, just like that. Bam. And this is really, really cool because this means that you can use the same syntax as VS Code, keeping standard code snippets to insert content. And because it's using VS Code's standard format, is that you can use the environmental variables in VS Code to insert dynamic content, kind of like the variables in Obsidian. So we can see date here actually has dollar sign current year, current month, current day. And if I did date, it will then insert standard content, year, month, day. And this is really awesome because if you have standard content formatting or just pieces of code that you wanna insert, you can put this into notes manually, or you could define your templates and still use this template code because remember how it said this rusty note, you could also still use the dynamic variables. So what you can't do is actually insert these variables like they are when you're doing the standard templates, except if you do something specific. So let's actually reload the index, and then we're going to create our Rust note one more time and see what gets inserted. So when I do s, correct, dot l for languages, dot Rust, nothing of these things gets inserted. So to utilize the VS Code mm, templated content, standard content, code snippets stuff, you have two options. One, you can manually insert, insert, insert a code snippet, and you could say like two for a to-do item and insert that, so you can use the code snippets, but Dendron lets you do something like Obsidian. I can do, and I have a hotkey for it, it's Command Shift, at, uh, command shift I, but the command is just um, insert note, which is basically insert template, but insert a note, so it could be any note, okay? But ah, templates, it's going to first look for templates, and I have a template, template.rust, so it's going to grab this content and insert it into the note. Watch what happens. Hey, the dollar sign uh, numbers are replaced with tab stops, so that actually lets me tab in between different locations in the document, just like the VS Code content, but also we get the current year inserted. That is really awesome because that actually is the using the dynamic content. So you can insert the notes manually, um, you can insert the templates manually and take advantage of these dynamic pieces of content or code snippets. But basically for these code snippet things uh, or the automated VS code stuff, 
you can't do that automatically. In some former capacity, it's a manual insertion to actually trigger those things, but still really useful and still really awesome. So one of the things I talk a lot about in personal knowledge management in general is the difference between soft and hard links, or basically a bi-directional link pointing from one file to another for a direct purpose, and the usage of tags or soft linking, linking regardless of context and tagging things. So in Dendron, we have the ability to, again, do both. And it's really cool how it also works in Dendron because kind of like Rome, it's tags are basically the same things as links. And let me show you what I mean. So when you look at this, um, I have a note called tags.seed. Now, I, what I wanna do is I wanna say, hey, seed is the tag. But again, they're all notes. So this seed note could have a description and endless content about what that note or that tag actually is or what it's about. And what that lets me do is inside of a given note, I can tag it. Now, just like in Obsidian or many other things, I can do hashtag and then the tag seed, or I could actually do the bi-directional link to tags.seed and they both still work. The difference being is that the hashtag actually denotes to you, oh, this is the tag, not just a bracket bracket link, a bi-directional link to something. So this one displays the actual note as, as the note itself, but this is actually using it as a tag. Functionally, there's no difference. The only real difference here is just how it's displayed in this preview. And, and also, I guess, that I could actually, I can hover over this tag and it shows me the same content as hovering over the link. I'm not sure if clicking the link, if I can click the tag, can I click the tag there? I can. So yeah, functionally, there is absolutely no difference. And if I click these things, and if I click seed here, it actually will take me and focus me on the note itself. If I close that note, and I go back here, and I click on that tag, it will actually take me to that note itself, and it just lives under tags. So not just having these things in folders, but again, following the dot hierarchy, you can have templates, tags, tasks, all these different things are still notes in of themselves living in their own hierarchies along with your all your other notes but the way that these notes and items are treated the behavior that they exhibit are different and you can take advantage of this because now that this note is tagged with seed i can go to this seed note tag basically a tag for or a note for the tag itself and in backlinks this is actually going to show me the information that I might get from Obsidian using the tags pane is that I can use backlinks just like any other note to find out every instance of where this tag is used on every file and every instance in that file of where that tag is used. So it's kind of a mix of behavior of how links are normally treated between two notes and that still contextless grouping of notes together based on a tag that doesn't really care about context. So using an indicator of status, my Obsidian uh, workflow usage of tags versus links can completely function here exactly as it does in Obsidian. And there's not really much difference. It's a very useful feature. Task management in Dendron. Now tasks in Dendron are a little bit more robust than Obsidian in a way. Obsidian really makes usage of tasks through a lot of the plugins because managing a task in of itself as like it is a task item versus just a note having some symbols that mean there's a task in that note. In Dendron, they're actually treated like entities because pretty much everything in here, a template, a tag, a, a task, they all are notes in of themselves. So there's actually some really cool behavior you can get with the tasks and they're a little bit more um, feature filled than in Obsidian by default, even before you do anything else with them. And I wasn't a very big fan of tasks in Dendron until I talked with um, Kevin, the developer, about like some ways of using tasks in Dendron and some different options, including some hidden options that really bring out the robustness of the feature that have actually sold me on it. And I need to refactor my workflow because it's actually really, really awesome. So let's take a look at that. So default behavior in a default vault 
is if I want to make a task, I can do the dendron command uh, task, create task note. So I can say create task note, and it's going to be, you know, whatever current note I'm on, I'm making a child task for that current note. So um, test task. Now what this lets me do is that now this note has a child test task, and you get all this additional metadata. Now this stuff is defined in the global configuration file for your Dendron Vault, and we'll take a look at that later on because we haven't even touched on configuring that. So status would just be like, what is the current status? We can do W for work in progress. Do, we can do um, February, we can do Valentine's Day. Priority is high, owner is me. And again, templates, you could probably fill this in, um, hopefully. So there's options and a test task. Okay, and then one thing that's really cool is that the name of the task could be, or the name of the task note could be the task itself. You could put it in the description, you could put it in the note body, or you could put whatever content you want anywhere in these notes, because it's all up to you. You could do whatever you want. So I could insert my Rust template, for instance, and bam, there we go, whatever, some content. Now, the cool thing about tasks, and also something that's being worked on, is the display of this information. So we have all this metadata information inserted in there. In the preview mode, it's a pretty looking preview, none of the stuff displays yet. But in the edit mode, what I can do is I can, I can actually link to that task, task, and find it, bam. And look what it actually does. It inserts a W for work in progress because that's the status, due date, the owner, the priority. It gives you all this information in a singular view, which is pretty handy when you have just lists of tasks that you might want to move forward or do something with. But where I didn't like the task feature to begin with is that I don't like, well, how do I find these things? I'm not going to know that this is a particular task or uh, there's no task view pane in here for Dendron tasks. How am I going to know where to aggregate these things, move them forward, deal with them, triage them, yada, yada, yada. How am I going to figure any of this out? And so what I do what I currently do in my um, actual um, Dendron Vault is that I rely heavily on the to-do tree plugin. So the to-do tree plugin or extension in VS Code looks for tags and I have all this stuff formatted and customized in my actual settings file. But what I do is I have all my tasks listed off in here and um, I have them tagged by different things. Uh, things I want to revisit, or active projects I'm working on, project items where I want to return to something specific, or different things I want to learn that are based on a note and not an input note, yada, yada, yada. Basically, like I have uh, all of this task management stuff outsourced to the to-do tree plugin. But where that was where I left off, I spoke with Kevin, and he showed me a bunch of things we can do with tasks to really accentuate the features and show off a lot more of the power of what you can do with them. And a lot of this comes down to editing the global configuration file, setting a schema, using a template, and treating the tasks as their own domain instead of as children of whatever current note you're on. So let's take a look at all of those settings. All right, the configurations. Now the file that we're looking at here is dendron.yaml. This is like the global configuration file for everything of yours. Now you can't access this within Dendron specifically, but what you can do is you can actually drag the file. So I, like, here's my dev log and here's the actual file and here's my actual dev log vault. So here's where Dendron actually looks. It doesn't even look up here. It uses these things, but you can't access them while you're using Dendron in VS Code. So what you can do is you can just click on this and drag it into VS Code and edit it. And so what we added, uh, or what Kevin showed me to edit, was when I am actually editing notes, we can see um, right here, workspace. And what we're going to look at is the do, 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 task. So for task, you can use, instead of the defaults, or kind of defaults, I changed a little bit of this, but um, the defaults being like child of current note, we don't want the tasks to be a child of a current note. We want to make them in their own domain. All tasks are centralized under a parent task note. The actual date format, 
which is standard for me, ISO 8601, and the name. There's no name here because it's a child task. But what we want is we want name to be task, date format is the same, add behavior is as own domain. And so what that lets us do is that now I have a uh, task that is just called task. This is the parent, okay? There's nothing here, it is just a uh, default normal note. It's not even a task note, it's just itself, okay? This thing is the parent of all tasks. Now it also has a child, which is task.temp task, or task.temp here. So this thing is the template for any of my tasks. So what we can do with that is now we've established its behavior. It goes to this one and uh, or we give it a name. Okay, cool. The schema. Again, schema is coming up again. Task.schema.yaml. We can ignore the first two lines. The name of the note is task. The title is task. Again, that's just a display in the um, command palette. The parent is root. So now it's basically just pointing to this .md file, this file right here. So we're pointing at this thing. Children, what are the children? And this is where you can then define more advanced behavior is your tasks can then be sorted based on year, month, day using the same sort of patterns that we did for our log or the daily notes. So year, month, day, okay? Now, if you just make the task use just the day, the number of the day, it's going to insert the task template. But if you say, hey, this day dot and then another piece of content, like a bunch of text, not just uh, the date stamp, then it will accept anything because wildcard and still insert the exact same template. This is awesome. So we saw the template content. This is a temp, okay? So now let's actually show what this looks like. And there is a little piece of functionality that I didn't explain yet that I will also show you. But what we can do is I can say task, insert, create task note, okay? And look at what it defaults to. Task is the parent, timestamp, and we can leave it at that. I don't have to insert anything else. So for today's timestamp, create a new note. Here's the template content. It is now a task and it has metadata ready for me to fill out. Ignore this one, okay? This is awesome. Now, if I also inserted something else like a subtask to this, if that's how I wanted to treat it, or if all of my tasks are only just sorted by date and then I say, do this thing and I create it, it also gets that template inserted. Really awesome. Now, it didn't do it this way and it inserted a normal note because I didn't use the insert uh, task command. So I would actually have to delete this, reload the index just because I need to be safe, reload index. And then what we can do is we can insert um, task, create task note, and then do this thing. And now it's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to insert the template content and it's also going to add all the metadata for it to be a task. So this makes it much more robust, but also to make me happy too, is that in the configuration settings that we looked at, Dendron configuration, is a little hidden feature of to do integration equals true. It defaults to false, but if you turn this to true, then what you get is in this note you saw up here, is it inserts to do and then the name or the title of the note. The title is just 13 because that's the last dot, um, dot content the, in the hierarchy. But what this is really awesome for is that now you can use the title like this, do this thing like it was here before I deleted it, da, 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 do this thing or whatever. And this is actually going to get picked up by to do tree now. So you can see, hey, we got the task notes over here. So in this way, you get the best of both worlds. That is awesome. So now I actually really like this concept and I need to think about how I'm going to refactor my workflow to use this new functionality of tasks. But this is really awesome. Now it's worth mentioning that I also only use tasks uh, and to what I do for to-do ma to -do management is really to-doist. And that's just like for my general life and everything. 
But when it comes to managing items inside of my knowledge vaults, Obsidian, Dendron, whatever, um, the to-dos and tasks are really just about fleshing out content and returning to things and stuff inside of the vault. It's never about me managing my daily life from within these applications. Other people likely do that and want to do that. That's never how I use it though, so I never approach it that way. But this is a lot of really cool, robust features that make this a very attractive feature within Dendron. Great job on tasks, guys. Okay, pods. What are pods? So something that's getting a lot of attention right now in Dendron and uh, developer attention and it's getting fleshed out more is pods version two. But let's back up, what are pods? So what you can think of as a pod in Dendron is kind of like the API, the interface between Dendron and other applications. Basically, how do I get information from that app into Dendron and from Dendron back out? And where this is really, really awesome is, let's just say you're going to convert from Obsidian or some other uh, plain text file based note taking tool, and you're going to convert that into Dendron notes. Well, where this really comes in handy is I actually had to uh, import all of my notes from Obsidian into Dendron using a pod because if you're just gonna take Markdown documents and dump them into Dendron, it won't work because Dendron actually assigns YAML metadata and a unique ID and pieces of information that you have to have on these notes for them to play well with Dendron. So what you need to do is you have to use a pod. And the way that you wanna structure your information is we all know now by now the dot hierarchies, you know, S for software, dot languages, dot Python, whatever. The way you want to structure your notes is if you have the idea of how you want the names to be and uh, how they're ordered, is make folders. Folders, parent, child, 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 folders, and put your notes in those folders because the folders become the dot hierarchies of the notes. And I had to do this for the import of my like 1500 notes or something from Obsidian. And I'm gonna show you how to at least get started with an import uh, using a pod. Now I'm not gonna use my vaults or uh, anything in Obsidian, but I'm gonna show you what it might look like. So flipping over to my uh, sample vault here. Now I have stuff in here and I'm actually going to use one of my other very tiny vaults um, in Dendron. It's gonna be like my Norwegian learning vault, but in any case, you're gonna make a pod. You want to make a pod. The first thing we wanna do though is we wanna have a destination for these notes. I could just say put them in this current vault or for the sake of the example, I'm gonna keep it you know, separate and I'm just gonna create a new vault and put stuff into there because you can have multiple vaults open at once. That's totally possible. So we're gonna do vault add. So vault add and I'm gonna make it local. And what is the path to my vault? If it's relative to my workspace root, so I could just press enter to cancel mm, vault two. No, let's just call this inbound. Okay, name of the new vault. I already did, I gave it, it's called inbound. So now it's going to reload. Uh, it's, yeah, it's gonna refresh the entire window and it's gonna give me a second vault. One is, not, is now my main one, that's just called vault. And the new one is gonna be called inbound. And when you see it refresh, it's going to show two different folders. Now, sometimes flipping back between vaults gets a little bit hairy when I'm making new notes, but for the most part, it really doesn't cause me too much trouble. But uh, it's gonna finish loading in a second. So a pod is really just another YAML file. And this YAML file is going to live in between, um, again, at that higher level above your vaults, so it doesn't, you can't like access the file directly from like you know the file pane but you can access this through, if you like look at, um, at the file outside of your Dendron note view, or if you access it through the commands in Dendron, like you can actually uh, edit the configuration of your pod because you can have a pod per thing. So it's just basically a YAML file. You're gonna point it at what you want. We're gonna set a couple settings and then we're gonna import some notes and you're gonna see how easy it is to use the pod. And I like to think of the pod as the API. You can import and export information, which means you kind of have an API for notes between Dendron and other applications. And the implications of that and the potential use cases are mind blowing because there's a lot of stuff that could be done with that. So we have inbound now, we have a new vault. So now what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to say I want to make an import pod. I'm going, I'm trying to import something. So I'm going to make an import pod. What kind of information am I importing? For instance, you could use JSON to import from Rome or LogSec or Markdown to import from Mar from Rome, LogSec, or Foam, or any of the other applications that use Markdown documents, but we're going to do that, Markdown. So that is going to give me this sample YAML file. And you can see the, the file path here, it's in our, you know, Dendron space, but instead of it being in the actual file folder for like the vaults or inbound, those are folders, it's going to put it into a folder called pods. And so this is where it lives, Dendron Markdown, and we can actually rename this to be something like Obsidian or whatever. So basically for each different imported location, you can have multiple pods. And these are not just like one-way connections. You can also have back and forth to import and export. So you can uh, edit documents in Dendron and in Obsidian at the same time and have them work back and forth. And Obsidian even has plugins now to deal with Dendron's naming structure and the dot hierarchies. So they're even better able to play nicely with each other. But let's get this configured and let's see what we can do with it. So I have my file path saved to what I'm gonna import over here. I'm gonna grab that really quick. If it will let me select my text. Come on now. Man, it's really hard. Okay, so it wants a string of a file path. And so I'm going to actually wrap it in quotes because I have forward slashes in there and I just wanna be careful. Okay, forgive the lag of my computer. The vault name is going to be inbound because that's the name of the location we want to drop the information to. And I'm also gonna add something here. So what you can actually do is include new front matter after you've imported something. So for instance, you could actually do something where you wanna say, I wanna make sure I look through every single note I've imported and made sure it's you know screened or reviewed before you finally let it settle in your new vault. So you could add a custom key and uh, we'll do just that. So for instance, I'm gonna add uh, Obsidian for instance. Let's just say these things came from Obsidian and true. So like it's true that it came from Obsidian. So that's really all like we would have to do is really just these two things, but you can also have additional other options that the documentation is pretty great on pods on Dendron's website, but for all we need to do to actually import something into Dendron, this is it. This is it. Where is it coming from? Where is it going? And if you want to add some custom stuff to it. So now we can actually say import uh, import pod. Okay, and we're going to say markdown. And it's going to say finding documents in the bottom right. And it's imported 15 notes successfully because it imported my Norwegian study vault in my other, my actual uh, Dendron area. Now you can see that this doesn't look like the dot hierarchy because of the way it treats named notes. Um, so really this is meant for like external notes, not another Dendron vault. Um, so if you did this from Obsidian, it would look a lot cleaner. But basically, yeah, you, you can ignore a lot of the duplication here, um, but there is duplication. But really it adds all of the front matter that you need for the item to actually work. Like I think this is all the original stuff and everything else here or most of this here is just junk that it capped and duplicated. But this is really awesome because if you're importing an Obsidian Vault, it makes it painless to just import everything in bulk. And now if you add folders, you can see this is all top level because no folders. But if you actually add folders, it makes your dot hierarchies representative of the folder structure. So that is a very easy way of organizing other applications to play seamlessly with Dendron back and forth. And Pods V2, the current version that's being worked on, has a lot of really great potential in doing some things with tasks and Airtable that when that feature launches, it's gonna be really, really cool to see what can be done with you know collaborative teams and just collaborative work in general. Because ultimately this whole, everything in Dendron is collaborative because even if you don't have live share, and I mean, you can just do VS Code live share, but what you can do with Dendron is it's in VS Code that you have Git. You have basically collaborative environments for your documentation and your workflow. So, I mean, you can't use Dendron with uh, the 
cloud version of VS Code on uh, GitHub, but even if you have it on your local system and you push changes and have like a uh, script that runs on cron and pushes your changes constantly to your team's area, and even if you just do documentation on branches and can merge branches, this is a great way of doing collaborative team documentation. And it's something even I want to try and see if my team wants to do. So pods are amazing. And it's really essential if you're going to import from Obsidian. So do check that out. And the example is very simple. So again, because we are in VS Code, this means that all the tools of developers and programmers everywhere are at our fingertips. Namely, and one of the most important things, is that you have the ability to use source control or Git version control. Now, the example of my actual Dendron vault is probably better because uh, you can see that I've edited files. Things have changed, uh, maybe not in the instance because I actually have it running automatically. But if I actually delete this file, uh, delete, and I delete this task, delete, then it's actually going to show that things have changed in my vault. The version control changes. And this is incredible because it means I have a complete history of everything that ever happened in my vault ever because I have this on an automatic timer. And some things that you can also do is if you actually want to run, you know, syncing as tasks and other things, is that's totally possible. And we'll get into that later. But because you have Git, you have the ability to roll back to prior versions, all the tooling on Git that you could ever want. And I have many videos on Git workflows, Git extensions. There's a lot of great stuff like Git graph if you wanted to use this to determine uh, and see like the history of your vault. This is a great extension to do that. I don't have a lot of branches, but you can see like at each sync exactly what changed and in them what changed. So this is just the big tip of the iceberg with what you can do with version control on a Dendron vault. Now, this also opens you up for collaboration because like any other software project, you're doing Git version control on a bunch of text files that multiple people are editing. So just like anything else, you got that. You also have VS Code Live Share so that you can actually collaboratively edit the same document at the same time. I personally wouldn't do that. I don't really care for that or like the live Google Docs experience of things. But having code under version control, having text and documentation as code under version control is awesome. And also when you're editing a document itself, you can also use the git blame and you can see who edited the document, how long ago, or what went into this document. And even though I'm the only one who's edited this thing, it really, if you actually work on a collaborative team, it can show you the entire history of every line of every document ever. And that is mind blowing because you're gonna have a complete history of everything. You're never gonna lose anything ever again. So the collaborative aspects of Dendron for teams and documentation, using that rigid yet flexible hierarchy model is amazing. I've never seen anything else like it and it's really, really fascinating. Now let's say you actually wanted to take your notes and if you've seen Obsidian publish or you just want to have some way of publishing your notes, well the Dendron team actually makes this incredibly easy and simple and it's actually, it's actually kind of funny how easy it is to set up a published version of your vault of notes on GitHub using GitHub pages. It's very, very simple. So because you have all your notes in VS Code and you can use Git on them and you can put all of your stuff onto a Git repository and use version control, you're already on GitHub. We can use the pages feature and get on a GitHub repo and actually publish our notes to GitHub pages. And the great thing is they have a very awesome step-by-step -step guide of just everything you need to know about getting all of your stuff off the ground. And if you want to see like an example of this, uh, because this is all relatively easy to, to do, install a CLI client, run some stuff, commit, push, make a branch, add an action. It's all documented here and it's really, really easy. Follow this thing, you're going to understand it. You want to see an example? You can check out my developer blog on my GitHub. It's one of my pinned uh, repos. And it's really just everything about my vault. And then I have my GitHub action that actually runs everything. Every time I push a new, um, uh, a new commit to the repo, it rebuilds all of the published site. And then I have my cron job that runs, um, basically if there's any changes to my Dendron files, then 
push all that stuff up to the repo and it runs every like half hour. And a published site, though I haven't optimized my notes and stuff for it, looks something like this, like Dendron's own documentation because I haven't modified the theme or anything yet either. But you know, you got tags, uh, mine look weird because I use emojis and you know, you got schema stuff here. And it's just a lot of, it's just really easy and you can search too. So this is what you can get. And if you also want to see my notes on where I publish my notes on my website, uh, I also have notes here and you can see like my Obsidian publish or my developer uh, log here. So it's incredibly easy to get your notes published too. And the documentation on Dendron just gets better and better over time because it gives you step-by-step step everything you need to do to get something off the ground. Yeah, it took some time for me to figure it out, but once you do, now it's, it's all automated. I don't have to do anything for it and it's free. Okay, and finally, after all of this stuff, how Dendron works, what about Dendron, all these things about Dendron, how do I use Dendron? So that's what I'm gonna show you. And you've seen a lot of my structure and a lot of the ways that I've been, I, do, I approach things and do things based on like the examples that I've shown in this video. But how do I specifically use this in my day-to-day, -day, in my own personal use case? So Dendron, I use specifically for my tech notes, anything related to uh, technology, server stuff, um, software engineering, general IT things, anything related to tech. I put into here. And it's really useful because everything in tech usually follows a fairly rigid structure. Um, I also have stuff I've been looking at, thinking about doing like with my Norwegian studying and maybe my like physical education type of notes because of, again, factual knowledge. But for the most part, the only thing of real substance in here is my tech notes. But I have notes on like all things uh, command line interface. I have commands and different types of stuff. Uh, I have notes on ways of writing documentation because a lot of what I do is very important with documentation. Um, H is for my home lab. And so I've been working on like home lab projects. Um, come on, man. Oh, hardware. So actually H is for hardware. Home lab I think is in projects. So I also use these um, single letter uh, items and names for the schemas and hierarchies because it makes it very easy to type and maneuver around. Uh, my inbox is really, this is where I've been putting some things that I want to review, even though I do have a place for inputs. So this is kind of like a duplicated area, but it's kind of also, um, inbox is kind of like the inputs that I really want to process next. Um, I have one for Linux because I'm working on my full Arch Linux build, and I'm going to be putting a lot of notes into Linux, and it's a very prominent topic for me. My log is just my you know, daily notes, and honestly, a lot of the daily notes are really just a list of inputs I might have read, or just things that I discovered on a current day. Um, and uh, I have N for networking, because I just finished my Network Plus exam for CompTIA, and there's a lot of stuff that this actually really helped me with studying, because like I made for each port, I can say port 22 for SSH, it also would link back to the SSH protocol. And so when I flesh out notes on either of these things, I can have it linked back either to port or to protocol. And uh, like that's just an example of some of the stuff I've been taking notes on for networking. And there's just a lot of stuff to add there. Uh, so basically the top level is just either uh, sorting structure and metadata related stuff, like all projects or all software related things and structuring a hierarchy, or it's just something that's a very prominent topic for me that I put a lot of information into. I have P for projects, and then I have like a project backlog, things that I'm doing, priority projects, or things that are just to do. And um, so like backlog is like way behind, and to do is like coming up, doing, I'm doing now, and priority is like the thing I'm currently focused on. Um, so like things that I'm doing right now are my home lab and Dendron itself. So I was learning more things about Dendron, like uh, variables and other stuff. So this actually could move by now but I also have notes for my home lab. And for instance, I'm putting Proxmox as a hypervisor on one of my servers. So what about Proxmox? Um, it's a hypervisor, so I can see, like if I actually rendered this note, it shows me the term, or in this case, N, uh, it's showing me networking stuff. And it's gonna show me like, okay, what's a hypervisor? And this actually just links to a video that explains it, but I might actually have a definition. But for Proxmox, what's the configuration stuff I might want to know? What's the resources on Proxmox to help me uh, learn more about 
the resources of Proxmox. And there's just stuff like this. So I got servers where I want to learn about my actual servers, um, services I want to run on them. So this is like project based stuff. I have R, which is my inputs or um, research resources or whatever. Um, did I actually say, is it, is it research or something? Yeah, research. And so in this, this is actually where I kind of keep the special symbol taxonomy that I had from Obsidian because by now it's just a mental model that makes sense to me. And uh, what I have is the same thing, you know, a, a bang is for a tweet or ands, uh, ampersands are for research papers, uh, parens are for articles. And so I can actually have um, a list of, and see, this is one thing that's really cool about the hierarchies is in Obsidian, I have I used a bunch of tags to keep track of everything. With this, what I can do is sort of the same thing of the way I named notes in Obsidian, where I have you know the symbol, so like a, an, a paren for an article. And then if I finished reading that article and it's done being processed, then it just had an ISO 8601 date stamp. So basically the date I finished processing it, and then the actual name of the note. But when I do that same thing here using Dendron, I can group all of my articles based on the symbol dot hierarchy to year dot month dot day dot the actual name of the item. And so what this lets me do is underneath the paren, it shows me all the things that I still have yet to process and read or do whatever with. And then under the timestamps, it can show me by day the items that I actually finished processing. So just by the nature of having them have the date hierarchy shows me that those notes are done. They're finished processing and all my inputs of type are here. So if I know I want to watch some videos, I can actually go to my video drop down and see all the videos I want to process. And I'm constantly adding to this list and it makes it very, very easy to keep track of my inputs. And when I finish an input, I just tag it on my daily note of, Hey, I finished this. If I took notes on something and let's say I took notes on a new Python library, I could just make a copy of everything or refactor those notes, refactor the hierarchy and put them on that library in Python. And it's easy to move around those notes and just, oh, it's just awesome. And then S of course is for software. By now you've probably seen that example and I have a bunch of sub items. So software, so query, Q for query languages. So I can do Postgres SQL or T SQL. I got a lot of stuff on T SQL. Um, I have, uh, O for, um, what is that? What is O again? I forget. Oh, other, just other, other types of things like make files or the DAX, um, data stuff in like Excel or power pivot, uh, M for, um, what is this markup languages? So like any of these documentation type stuff, graph, law tech, markdown, restructured text, etc. Um, L for languages, and so I got notes on all these different programming languages, lots and lots on Python, infrastructure as code, when I start doing more stuff like that with my servers, containers, because uh, I'm really focusing on containers and Docker and Kubernetes right now, um, DB for database stuff, data formats, so things like HL7, CSVs, JSON, XML, etc. Um, specific apps that I might use, um, Obsidian's for one, Visual Studio, VS Code, all kinds of stuff under software. It's probably my biggest um, area. And then I have scratch notes. Sorry, the camera went off there. I have scratch notes, of course, because I might have ideas or one-off ideas. Um, so there's that idea of a scratch note that could be done. I have tags and I can, as you can see, I use emojis still for my tags here. And it does the exact same thing for me here as it does in Obsidian. If I wanna you know, go back through something and I wanna continue to flesh it out, I can do that with these status tags. And um, I still also use to-do tree though, because this actually tracks things like revisit. Like if I wanna actually uh, revisit something like Neo4j, that might be because right now I'm focused a lot on doing Postgres and I wanna get a T-SQL virtual machine set up on my uh, server. When am I ever going to touch graph databases in Neo4j? I don't know, but I want to revisit that because that might be something that would be really cool and interesting and useful and have applications that I might be interested in later on. And I don't want to forget to come back to that so I can tag it with a revisit. But active is like very active projects I'm currently looking at, which is mainly my two servers. Um, Ymir and Fafnir are my two named servers that I have right now. And those guys are going to be doing all my stuff. Learning, which is like, something that I 
want to learn more about, but it's not like a specific input. Like it's not an article, video, or podcast. It's just the topic of Ansible is something that I want to learn more about. So there's that. And then I have just general tasks um, with the, the angle brackets or the square brackets there. General to-dos, which is just a general to-do item. Um, and then I think I may have made some others, but these are like the ones that I use the most. So I still use that for like task management slash a little bit of like, um, what is it, state or just uh, stages of processing. But I do still use tags the way that I do in Obsidian here. Now tasks, I showed you all the examples of tasks that I did in the prior vault example. And so I still need to refactor how I'm gonna do tasks in here because I could take advantage of more of this functionality. So gotta think about that. Templates, I have them. I don't use a terribly large amount of them though, but they are you know, very easy to set up. So you set those up with your schemas and you indicate each different level or whatever you want your template to be for that particular item. You put it under templates and you can even maintain the schema. So you can do templates.log.whatever. So you can say, I'm gonna group all my log templates here. I love the dot hierarchy schemas. They make it so easy to organize things just by the name. Uh, I also have like a bunch of terms, which is really just, you know, terminology or acronyms. So like MITM would be like minimum uh, or man in the middle. So it could be um, MTF, which is minimum time to failure for like an IT term. But this could be MITM for man in the middle attack. I can even reference when I added that term. There's a bunch of stuff that uh, can go into terms, but really it's a great way of defining acronyms that I can then use throughout my vault, but then link them back to the actual definition of them. So it's easy to see the definition of acronyms. And then theory is just kind of like the tech theory. So like agile or anti-patterns, mental models of things in tech. And for mental models, it could be like, yeah, KISS, YAGNI, MVP, uh, different things like that. There's a lot of stuff in here. I don't really use the graph in Dendron much at all, but it is available. And also something I haven't mentioned is the schema graph. So there actually is a graph for notes and you've seen that, you've seen my note graph. But if you did the graph for schemas, you can actually see at the, like the highest, most abstract level, the um, structure of your vault, just based on the schemas that you have. And if it will render, it's actually really neat to see all the breakdowns of the different schemas that you have. So software for one for me, and then it can go into uh, research over there, because devlog, and then software query. And from, from query, it goes into all of these items. And from language, it goes into all of these items. And this is all the stuff that's defined in the actual YAML schema files. And there's some, you know, a couple loners out there, but yeah, so you can also see like at the high level, the abstract structure of your vault, and that's really cool. And finally, I have my cron job set up on my uh, home computer so that every like, half hour, any changes to my, my Dendron notes, just like Obsidian, it pushes that to GitHub automatically. Git add everything, commit it, push it, and gets it up there. The push means it runs the new um, GitHub action, which means it republishes that vault and rebuilds the entire website. And all of this just happens in the background. I don't have to do anything manually. But when I'm on my work machine running Windows, I do have to run something manually because it doesn't I could set it up to be somewhat, you know, automatic of syncing, but there is still some issues. And I'm on a VPN, so sometimes it doesn't work because it, my VPN would block the Git traffic, even though I could do it if I turned the VPN off. So what I tend to do is sometimes I just need to, okay, I, I made some notes. I just want to quickly sync those up and then I'm done for the day, turn off my work laptop. So what I can do is I actually have VS Code tasks. So if I actually want to say um, open user tasks, or actually, what is it? Um, tasks, uh, configure task. And it's gonna give me a list of my tasks that I have available to me. And so what I do is I have um, several different syncs. So I can do sync windows. And what this lets me do is I have a bunch of tasks here, but this one specifically, come on now, open, is sync win for windows is this will actually CD to my workspace folder. So it goes directly to my root folder, pull, get at everything, commit using a date format and then push because this is actually running in PowerShell, not straight up bash. So I do actually need to have like this date format stuff run a little differently uh, because of the format. I think it was the format that it runs with um, PowerShell. So in either way, this is 
kind of a pain, but I also have other tasks. And this is something that I contributed. I'm not sure anybody's done this with Dendron yet before, is that if I want to see notes that I've made today or this month, I can actually run a task and it doesn't do anything more at this point than just give me a list of output to deal with. But what I can do is I can say um, task and I want to run one. So I want to say run a task. Show me the notes that I made this month. And I can do that and don't care. So then it's going to show me in the terminal, run all that stuff, and it's gonna show me a list of notes that I made that month. Doesn't look like I made anything this month. It's February, so that's odd. Um, but it doesn't look like it is done. So I guess I didn't make anything this month. Um, we can try actually making a, a new note. Let's just make a daily note, okay? And we'll rerun the task and see if it picks it up this time or if there's just a bug. Da, 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 da. Okay, yeah, so I guess I just haven't made any notes this month or my work computer hasn't synced. But in any case, I made this new daily note and then it will give me a list of every note that I made that month and it also formats it, adds the angle brackets and this basically is a way for me to do, like if I have a, a monthly review where I wanna see the notes that I made today, I wanna to quickly link them all in my daily note, I can just copy this list of formatted items, paste it in a note and now I have a correct bi-directional link to the item itself. And that makes it much easier to do uh, like reviews and everything. So VS Code tasks, really useful. So I hope you enjoy this video. I really, really like Dendron. It's very awesome and it's really great for my, my mental model of understanding tech notes and how I approach them. And it's been a very fun experience of coming to this, leaving, coming back with a new perspective, and then diving headfirst into it because it has been just a blast because it's still also so new, but built on developer tooling, that there's a lot of really crazy awesome stuff you can do with code and automation in Dendron because it's free and open source, extensible, and built on top of an integrated development environment. So it's crazy powerful. And just the approach, the dot hierarchies, the scheme of files, pods, publishing, it's all just amazing. And I'm very much looking forward to more videos on Dendron in the future. And again, thank you to the Dendron team for sponsoring this video. It's been great to make some content about the extension itself, and I hope to do more. So with that, I'll catch you all in the next one.